Welcome to Western Trading Post TV. We are excited to be bringing you some of our favorite highlights from this season. We would also like to thank you for joining us each week and being a special part of the Western Trading Post family. Thanks again and God bless. Scene one, take two, Mary pulling one arm bandit's arm. Be surprised when you see this. Okay. Very unusual gun. This is an 1862 Henry rifle. Nah, a, a real Henry. A real Henry. An authentic one. I think Henry rifle. They only made about 14,000 of these, and you're telling me you're bringing me one in right I'm here. I'm bringing you one. They didn't make a lot of them, though. Yeah. That is amazing. That's cool. It's a great looking gun. It Plus, is. it has. Uh, George C. Carlson, the 1862 Civil War Inspector's initials on it. Wow, that's pretty neat. There, if I remember right, there's only like maybe 1,700 of these that that's were right. martially inspected. That's correct. That is amazing, Denny. Yep. Where'd you come up with something like this? Oh, I've been collecting for 20, 30 years and I just bought it a few years ago, but it took me a long time to find one I could afford. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so speaking of how much you could afford one, uh, what are you asking for this one? I'm asking 32,500 for this one. 32,500, well, Correct. that's that's about what it's worth there, but there's not much meat on the bone there for me <laughs> at that I price. I understand, Oh my gosh. Um, Gosh, I'd love to have a Henry here in the shop. It'd be great for the store. But um, what if we did like 23, somewhere in there? Ooh, wow, you're killing me. <laughs> <laughs> I got to have more than that. You got to have more can. than that? It's too, too nice a gun. Yeah, maybe 25, would that uh, work? What do you think, Donna? <laughs> a little, little bit more. A little, little bit more, more. oh more my time. gosh. Yeah. Um, I tell you what, I'm going to make one time, just lay it all out on the table, what I'd be willing to do. 27,500 cash money. You can always use the cash, Donna. You can always use the cash. Tell what you do what, you, you got a deal, my <laughs> we friend. We got a deal with we that? We got a deal. 27,500 cash, cool. Exactly. That's a Henry? Yeah, it's a Henry rifle. Pops, that looks just like a yellow boy. You know, that, that's a good point. This is something that you should learn right here. This is one of our yellow boys. Okay. That's a Henry. They do look very similar very because similar. of the brass frames. And really, the yellow boy mm -hmm. was just an improved version of the Henry, but the oh, Henry came out first. It was okay. a predecessor. It came out in about 1860. And if you look real close on the bottom of the magazine tube here, the, it's open on the Henry, and they figured out that that let dirt and grime in. So when they came out with the yellow boy in 1866, it's closed now. And then also, um, one of the things is when they, in the heat of battle, Whenever they were firing these rapidly, this barrel would get really hot mm -hmm. and it was hard to hold on to. So they put a wood forearm on the improved version in 1866. Okay. But they do look similar, um, but that's a good point right there. Thank you, thank you. So, so this one's a little bit older, right? It's older, for sure. How much is it? This one's 32,500. Okay, so why is this one worth more than this one, though? Well, it has to do with rarity. There was around 160,000 of the Model 1866 Winchester Yellow Boys made, there was uh, only 14,000 or so of the Henry's made from about 1860 to 1866. And of those 14,000, there were around 1,700 that were ordered by the okay. Union Army for oh, use wow. in the Civil War. Okay. This happens to be one of those 1,700, and we know that by the uh, inspector's initials that, okay. are, that are here on it. So, good question though. 
up that's like wicked cool. Yeah, Let's see if we can keep this one for more than a week at this time. <laughs> <laughs> well, we also have to keep the uh, the doors open and the lights on. So, but do we'll, we, see, we'll see do what we? happens. <laughs> okay, Pops, I'll see you in a bit. We'll see. Hey Jim, how wow. you doing? How are you doing? I'm doing real good. What are you doing here in town? Oh, I was just heading up north, so I thought I'd stop by to see if you picked up anything that I that I that I collect. Like tokens. Like old trade tokens. Trade tokens. Um, let's see here. Uh, I I got this Indian Wells token right here. Oh yeah, that's a nice one. I do have this one. You have that one already. But this is a nice Indian trader. They were very popular yeah. usage on the reservation because of. The minimal yeah. amount of coins available. Yeah. So they issued a lot of tokens. Sure. But you brought. I'm some. looking for something like these. Okay. You know? What did you bring? Um, well, here's one from Hardyville, Arizona. Hardyville. Okay. And it's, it's all ghosted out. There's nothing there left. And it was a Colorado port town in the in the late 1860s. Wow. And, and that token is like one of Arizona's oldest tokens. From the 1860s. From, from, the, from the late 1860s, post Civil War. That's cool. And Mr. Hardy ran a toll road from Hardyville to the, to Prescott. Okay. In delivering supplies, and um, that token was good for one passage. It has like the it number says one number on there. It number one on it. Cool. And that token is unique. Yeah, that's that cool. is unique. And here's another one from right here in Casa Grande. Casa Grande. Okay, Gilt Edge Saloon. The Gilt Edge Saloon. That's one of Arizona, That's one of Casa Grande's most famous old saloons. Sure. And um, that token dates. Pre 1914, as the saloon burned down yeah, in 1914. That's when the whole town burned down that's in 1914. Big, wow, the whole town. But, that's... but that token is like really special. It has saloon. It says Casa Grant, Arizona, spelled out. Yeah. It says good for one drink. Good for one all drink. on one side. Yeah. And what makes that token good? really special it has a picture of the Casa Grande ruins on the back That's which is scarce for tokens and what would one like this be worth something like that would be like about 800 bucks 800 bucks 800 okay. wow it could be more you know it, it yeah. really depends on how bad the person wants it. yeah and the condition and, and the everything condition. sure sure what and else you got there here is a real historical one from Charleston AT, which stands for Arizona Territory. Arizona Territory, sure, that and, Charleston. And Mr. Ayers, the proprietor of that saloon, um, ran a saloon in Charleston, which is like well known as a as a as a town where the where the cattle wrestlers, sure. the cattle thieves, they all hung out in, in Charleston because it was close to the Mexican border. And it was right next to Tombstone, right? It was about like ten miles. Or ten so? miles or so from sure. Tombstone. Okay. That is a very rare token. That's only like one of two known. One of two known. Wow. And I really had to pay a lot because I always, always wanted a Charleston. That was what would one like this be worth? I then? paid thirteen five, thirteen thousand five hundred. Wow, that that's is, amazing. That is that is a that is a really really that's great a, token. A cool Very piece historic. of history right there. Exactly. And here's another cool piece of history. This is from the Campbell and Hatch Saloon. I've heard of that. Right. Why have I heard of it? Because that's where Morgan Earp was shot. Okay. And that was Wyatt's brother. Yeah. And um, he was shot playing pool with his brother mm -hmm. inside of the Campbell and Hatch Saloon in March of 1882. Okay, so this, right after the whole OK Corral thing. It was about five months after the whole OK Corral. Yeah. And there was still a lot of, a lot of animosity. And, and the assassin saw Morgan and Wyatt playing pool. Mm -hmm. And. He, uh, and he, his intended target was for Wyatt Earp, but he sure. shot his brother and he died like On a accident. few hours, you know. And what would one like that bring? Uh, like that. Um, I got lucky. I, I paid 600 for that, but something like that would be like twelve, fifteen hundred dollars. Twelve, fifteen hundred. It's not that that rare like the other ones. There's probably about five, five okay. known. But the historical. It, significance of that token is this token may have been in the saloon when absolutely Morgan was killed absolutely that, it was probably amazing. in that saloon you probably heard the gunshots and everything yeah I, that's know, a, because it, it only certainly only talk huh well thanks bob i appreciate you sure bringing thing. those in and showing me that sure that's thing really anytime neat. thank you now you know what to look for thanks <laughs> well hey bobby Hello. See you again. So good to see you. What are you up to? I am on a new adventure. So Remember, last time I came in, 
I had those inherited pieces. It has, oh, well, it's catapulted me down a road I never thought I would go. Um, I've been kind of looking on the internet and kind of go to this side, I go to that side. I see turquoise, I see silver, I see bracelets, I see necklaces. I don't know the good from the maybe not so good because I'm really looking into making a collection a collection I can hand down to my kids, hand down to my daughters, to my granddaughters, whatever, but I'm looking for something really, really nice. You know, it's actually a fabulous investment. Okay. And as you're looking around at different places on the internet, different stores, yeah. you're gonna see prices that vary. You're gonna have all day long here, yeah. 2,000 here. Yeah. And people are like, why are they so different? Yeah. So if you think about it like this, you have a Mercedes mm -hmm. and you have a Honda. They're of which I neither have. <laughs> <laughs> no, know. but you have that fancy truck. I do, I do. <laughs> so you have, it's, it's similar in the mm -hmm. jewelry as well. Mm -hmm. You have the artists that are bigger name artists or older pieces. Mm -hmm. You have the different mines that the turquoise comes. So it all plays a effect in the price of the piece. Oh. Let, me, let me give you an example here. So much so, to learn. It, so it, excited. Is, I'm so excited. An Hopi artist, okay. Preston Menangi, and he was um, born in 1927, mm -hmm. and around 1991, I think, is when he passed away. Okay. He is quite, quite collectible. So anytime you have pieces of his, um, they really fly off the shelves mm -hmm. quick. And so, I mean, this is a $3,000 bracelet here, just to give you an idea. Oh my gosh. Yes, and you're like, wow, that's, it's just a silver bracelet, right? It's beautiful, it's it, it artwork. Is, it's the maker okay. that really gives it the value because he's so highly sought after. Okay. Um, let's see, we have Morris Robinson, who is also a Hopi artist, and he was born around 1900 and passed away in 1984, I believe. And he has some very traditional, beautiful style pieces. Oh, those are beautiful. And he is also highly, highly collectible. Okay. So. Mercedes Honda. Okay. All okay. Right. And really the factor, beautiful turquoise, but when you just look at it, why would you think that, you know, this is a $2,500 bracelet? Mm -hmm. So as you're starting to learn to invest in quality pieces, mm -hmm. that's something to keep in mind is the artist, or we have the mine where the turquoise comes from. Okay. And so some turquoise is higher grade than other turquoise. One of my favorite, guess where it's from? Arizona, yes. And it's the Bisbee line. Oh, that's line. beautiful. It is an exquisite, that, exquisite turquoise. That is and beautiful. And so there's a lot of collectors that look at Bisbee turquoise. Okay. You know, as you're looking at the beautiful coloration from the Bisbee, and then you just have to I know it's going to Oh, Bobby! <laughs> oh, I think I found my next okay. piece. Okay, try it on. Okay. okay. So it's so fun to learn as you are starting to collect mm -hmm. and starting to put your collection together. Mm -hmm. You just have to decide, okay, which one do you love today? There's <laughs> so much to know. There's so much to learn. I always come to you guys. You help me so much. Well, it means the world to us. Um, Bobby? Uh-oh. I'm gonna take that one. Oh, oh. <laughs> you know, this is, this is a spectacular piece and I think yeah. that you will truly enjoy it. Okay, one more. Well, we'll write you up okay. and we'll get you out the door. Yay, I'm gonna fun. browse. Okay. Let's see what else I can take <laughs> home to well, add to my new collection. Holler at me. <laughs> All right, thanks, Bobby. John and Melissa, you guys dropped off this wonderful collection earlier and I've had a chance to go through it. And wow, I am truly impressed. One of the, the things that I really, really enjoyed seeing and getting to research was this signal cannon that you brought in. And where did this come from again? Uh, it came from Tularosa, New Mexico. Yeah, so there's an inscription on the top here that it says it was presented to the by 
chloride of gold club in July 4th of 1891. And that had me bum puzzled for a minute. I'm like, what is bichloride of gold right? club? So I actually did some research and found out that the bichloride of gold clubs were basically an early form of Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> so it had to have been presented by one of the members to the club, which is fitting because uh, back then, like 1890 and early 1900s, shooting was a sport that was as popular as like football or baseball is today. So uh, presentation arms were very common back then. So uh, that, this has got some neat history to it and, and I'm excited to see it. And um, I did a little bit of research on it and uh, it's not super ornate or engraved or anything like that, but still a, a cannon from the 1890s, a signal cannon like this, ought to bring, you know, 12, 1500 at auction. So it's, it's got some good value. Now, where did you guys get this collection from? This is my mom's collection. Uh, she worked for the Castle Grand Ruins National Monument for 25 plus years. And she dealt with a lot of different native artists and stuff through her tenure. And I remember as a kid going out, we'd spend our weekends out in the desert at different sites. And that's where some of this older stuff came from right here. But the more modern stuff she collected and her last, her, one of her last wishes was to sell it all together as the as Betty Gill collection. Uh, as one collection. Yeah. I just want to say from both of us, all of us, that we really feel blessed that you brought this collection to us, right? Yes, we we're very honored to handle the collection. and. Uh, I've looked everything over, the pottery and the cannon and, and uh, the jewelry and all that kind of stuff. And, and I, I feel like uh, fairly, to be fair to you and us, that we could pay you 2750 for the collection if that works for you. Thank you, babe. That sounds good to me. Well, we'll, Fitting we'll, in. All right. Thank you guys for thank bringing you. it to Well, us. thank yeah. you so much. Yeah. And we're thank so you. sorry for your loss, thank you. but thank we'll you. find good homes. Okay. Oh, thank know. you. We are here at the Casa Grande Ruins, which is about 20 miles east of Casa Grande and is the namesake for our fabulous town. The ruins have been here for over 650 years and they are one of the largest prehistoric dwellings in North America. In the 1700s and early 1800s, only a trickle of travelers came by the Casa Grande ruins. Some of the first were Spanish explorers, including Father Kino, who was the first to document the ruins in 1694, and then the Mexican and American travelers who were curious about the ruins. More people started to visit after 1879 when the railroad first reached the town of Casa Grande, about 20 miles away. Travelers scratched their names into the walls. Some of them took artifacts and even pieces of the walls as souvenirs. In 1889, Congress voted to protect the Casa Grande ruins from further vandalism and looting. They voted to pay for clearing of debris and repair of the foundation. The wooden beams and metal rods you see today were installed in 1891 to brace up some of the walls. Three years later, the federal government made the Casa Grande ruins the nation's first archaeological preserve. Mr. Dallas, sir. Hey, Robin. How are you, bud? I'm doing fantastic. Super. Did you find out anything else about that knife? I did. I did. Okay. I had a chance to do some research. This is the pattern, the model is called a rifleman's knife. Okay. And the first ones that we know of were made by Ames of Massachusetts. They were a sword maker. Okay. They made a lot of Civil War swords. Mm -hmm. Very, very collectible. This one is not marked, unfortunately. So it is conceivable, mm -hmm. but I would never say it's an Ames. Okay. Okay. Because. Simply because you can't prove it? Because you can't prove it. Okay. But the, if you look online, as I did, you'll see this exact handle shape, this uh, exact pommel shape, mm -hmm. everything is the same. The guard, it's all. Uh, somebody could have copied it in a blacksmith mm -hmm. shop. We don't know. Yeah. But date-wise, 
Ames started making this model knife in the 1830s, prior to the Civil War. Okay. They call it rifleman's knives because a guy carried it with his belt. Uh, and it had, oh, and, and this sheath is not original. Okay. I wish it was. Okay. But um, there's an auction online that has already happened. I think it was 2017. It yeah. was an Ames, mm -hmm. it was marked, so for over $10,000. You're kidding, no, over 10000 Over ten grand. Okay. So, who knows? Mm -hmm. Roll the dice, don't roll the dice. Mm -hmm. I roll the dice. Okay. <laughs> so, and that's how I got uh -huh. here, right? But um, you had talked about what you what you hope would be an investment quality. Uh -huh. There would be a little dice rolling in this. Mm -hmm. a flip of a coin. Pretty safe bet. Okay. That you're going to get appreciation because there's a there's there's already history regarding a very similar knife made by a known maker. Okay. So, you know, the choice would be yours. The condition is excellent. You know what? This part of the knife, the upper part, is called a swedge. Okay. And it actually could have been sharpened and used, mm -hmm. but obviously this is yeah, the, this the main. Is, and it was more of a slashing knife versus a, a stabbing. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. But it's a beautiful example. Mm -hmm. That is amazing. Glad you like it. Mike, how's it going? How are you doing, Robbie? Long time no see, mate. Yeah, you too, man. What are you doing over here? Okay, I'm looking through the knives, right? And okay. check out this cool piece. It's a Wastenholm blade. Is that German? Well, check George Wastenholm has a very yeah. German name, but he was actually in England oh, right, yeah? when this knife was made. Oh, wow. It's a very nice little piece. So. Is this true? That it was actually in 1850? It's a very old blade, yeah. And oh, yeah. we can tell because of the hallmark. Oh. We can look it up and now is the time For period. For like the engraving yeah. and all that? Oh, it's between cool. 1850 and 70. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. Nice. Would anyone have a knife on you? Whoa. Grandmother. Hey, Mr. Hank, are you ready? I'm ready. It's Monday after auction. Auction. Oh, you got a big load, don't you? Gotcha, gotcha. You ready? We're here, here to we take go. care of you. Oh my goodness, look at this. Okay. All right. Mm. Gotta get into the shade. I gotta see. There we go. 